Hi, this is David Gronoski, host of A Neighbor's Choice and Things Hidden Podcast, as well as some of our other programs like Science and You with our Chief Science Advisor, Dr. You, and our Seed Oil Survival Series that we continue to have great fun unpacking the truth of nutrition. I wanted to give you a quick little message saying that we appreciate all the support that we get from our monthly contributors and our one-time donation supporters, and we'd encourage all of you to go to our website, neighborschoice.com, click on Contribute, and make a monthly pledge today, whether it's a dollar, five dollars, fifteen, twenty, fifty, whatever you want to do, doesn't matter. Just be a part of building this new media project that we've developed to empower and inform, to inspire, to kickstart a scientific renaissance, an anthropological breakthrough and reformation in the church. All these things are possible with your support right now. So make that commitment today and help us keep doing the productions that we have. Thank you. Today we have a, a conversation that is heavy. It's going to be tough and challenging, but I hope it will be edifying and inspiring for folks who are interested in understanding the spiritual reality of life, uh, the spiritual dimension of uh, ordinary, what seems to be ordinary, you know, happenings can have a spiritual underpinning that spiritual warfare is all about exploring. And uh, to do that, I have the very reverend, Father Daniel Rehill of St. Catherine of Siena Catholic Church with me. How are you doing? Good morning, David. Good. How are you? I'm doing well. So I, you know, our program is called Things Hidden, and we do, usually we look at things through the lens of, uh, we look at current events and uh, happenings in the world from an anthropological perspective, influenced by the work of the late uh, anthropologist Rene Girard who talked about, you know, mimetic desire and scapegoat. And he was looking at things, trying to make a scientific case on the anthropological side to confirm and support the theological framework. He said in his later life that where his anthropological and scientific work aired in contradicting dogma, he would, of course, defer to dogma and, you know, where, if there was any error. Um, but it's something that our audience has uh, engaged with on different levels. Um, there's, there's, Within the mimetic theory world, there's a little bit of uh, debate about the the nature of the diabolical. Some have suggested that you know, uh, you know, more of a modernist perspective says, and there's of course there's there's levels, there's a uh, variance here, but one pr perspective is that human beings are spiritual beings, and so demonic uh, entities are almost like spiritual STDs, so to speak, that human beings being interdividual, inter interrelated. Rene Girard says that we are not islands unto ourselves. Our self is constructed by its relationship to the other in a kind of Trinitarian way. And that when those, when our spiritual beings are interacting with other spiritual beings, that uh, mimetic voices can get ensnared and wrapped up and they can sound like distinct entities, distinct beings. And therefore it is a spirit, but it's not, a spirit that was a, a member of a choir who fell down. Now, of course, the traditional view is these are spirits that come down from the fall with Satan and that they were members of an angelic choir. And some have said, well, where's the real evidence for that? Or, you know, so there's debate here. Where do you stand on that? And does that matter? Uh, ultimately, uh, again, the more extreme liberal would say, okay, it's just, it's just psychological phenomenon that you're projecting as spirit. And then another stage is saying, oh, they're spiritual beings, but it's 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 derived from human sin, human origin. And then there's the other one that says, no, these are fallen angels who were members of a choir. Okay, well, they are they are fallen angels, who then we call demons. And if you want a scriptural reference to that, it says, you know, and and Lucifer fell down to the earth like lightning. So yeah. 
And he made his camp on the shore where he's waging war against uh, the children, the children of God. Well, see, this is us, you know, it's not, it's not Eve. When, the, when God says, I, I will put enmity between you and the, the woman between her children and yours or his children and yours, whichever version you have. He's not talking about Eve. He's talking about God's children. And then the blessed mother, if you want to look at her as the, the protectress, the one who is Jesus gave to John, gave to all of us too. So the, yeah, they're real. Um, do, do humans make bad decisions and cause sin? Yes, they do. I think they're influenced by these demons to make bad decisions, but they do have a free will. And so when we choose to sin, the wage of sin is death and death enters the world in a more profound way every time we sin. And the more times we sin and death enters, the more power we give these demons. So I would say to you why 2023 is looking so difficult and awful all over the planet is because we keep sinning and we keep pushing God further away. Now, God's a gentleman. And if just like if you go back to the Old Testament, when the Jews said, you know, we're we're tired of this, we're going, we want to worship Moloch or we want to Baal and we want to set up altars to these gods. God said, I give you free will, do what you want. But that means I'm no longer going to protect you because you're no longer you don't want to have me in your life. So they go and do this. And what happens? They get crushed. And every time they get crushed, they come running back and go, please take us back. Of course, he always does. But there's a penalty. There's always a penalty. There's justice with every evil act. So that's kind of the whole, uh, what I see from my side of it, looking at it from the exorcist perspective. And I, you know, we dialogue with these demons. You know, it's not something we encourage people to do, but I, I do ask, who are you and how did you come here and what, what gave access to this person? And oftentimes they'll tell you, now we know they're liars too, so you can't take everything as as gospel, but but over, you know, the, the centuries, cumulatively exorcists have learned a few things. They pretty much need permission to enter. They pretty much need permission. And that could come literally as grant, granted permission. If you saw the movie um, Nefarious, did you see that? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Do you remember when he's toying with the, with the, what is it, a lawyer? I guess it's yeah. a lawyer. Yeah, and he's to like, oh, come on, yeah, he's like, come on give, me, give me permission to come into you. And he's like, no, I'm not going to do that. He goes, why? You don't believe in me. So he finally gets him to trick him into saying, sure, come into me. And then nothing happens. Because once they gain permission, now they have full right to come in whenever they choose. And we see later in the movie when he chooses his moment to go in. And then the guy is like, oh, that was a big mistake. I shouldn't have given permission. But we also get permission by... Uh, grave sin, um, addiction to pornography, drugs, all sorts of things like that, um, a dabbling in the occult, witchcraft, voodoo, all these things are open doors where we're basically giving permission because we're participating in idolatry. And that's the sin that always got the uh, the Jews in trouble in the Old Testament. And it's the same today. It just is dressed up in a pretty package. Now, I've interviewed a few different exorcists and investigated different uh, works on this matter, um, and I have to say, and, not, and I don't, I don't want to bring up any specifics in particular, but sometimes it seems like there are slight contradictions as to how demons operate, or what they're allowed to do, or how they're going to function. You know, and, and and you see a little bit of variance, like, um, uh, like I, you know, hostage to the devil by Malachi Martin. You know, he talks about certain things that they do, and then I've asked other exorcists within the same church as his, him. And he says, and they say, no, that's not correct. And it's like, so then the doubting Thomas in you says, well, I mean, what's going on here? You know, if these things are really doing what they're doing, why is it that one of them who engages with them say they operate by these rules? And then another one says, oh no, they would never do that. Like he, he talks about, for example, total possession, which is something that like, you know, they totally possess you and stuff. And then there's contradiction about as to, you know, what he talks about a priest being, possessed and uh and then some just say no that wouldn't happen like that or you know all these different things like that and of course humans are fallen and fallible so there's mistakes but how do you sort that out i mean i don't i know it's kind of a broad question but it feels like sometimes there's been some contradictions as to the modus operandi of of these entities as well as the rules of engagement yeah that's true because it is not a science because they're spiritual beings which have no body and they are, for the most part, much more intelligent than we are. 
you know, there are certain choirs of these that are, you know, I've interacted with some of them, they see dumb as a, as a doorknob, but for the, most of them are going to outwit you in any kind of, you know, dialogue back and forth. So we tend to not listen to them. Uh, Malachi Martin's book was, you know, basically a documentary of these four cases he had, and he put it into a book form. So I would have to trust that what he wrote down is probably pretty accurate according to the way he saw it. But that doesn't mean that's always going to be the case, you know? So when we're dealing with these things, we try to make uh, general predictions based on past experience. It's like the stock market. You know, it seems like these things are happening. So it looks like if we do this, we're going to make this much money in the next month. But then a crash hits and everything goes south and you weren't predicting that and you and you don't know what happened. That can happen too with demons. Like we think we know how they're operating, but we never know what's in, in the mind and the heart of the victim, right? So I can ask the victim questions. Have you ever dabbled in the occult? No, never. And then after like the third exorcism, the mother reveals that you know, as a baby, the child was satanic, ritually abused, and nobody told the kid. And now we start to understand more about why these things are afflicting him. But without the information, we wouldn't know, and we wouldn't know how to perceive what's happening to the victim. Um, we had a nun that happened to, who was in a very famous religious order, and she came from Rome to be delivered. It took a year of daily prayer and weekly exorcisms with this woman to finally get the thing out of her because it had been with her her whole life and she was kind of accustomed to it. And what in her subconscious wasn't fully prepared to let it go because for much of her life, she felt that was her only companion, even though it was something that was harming her. It's a very strange dynamic. You knew it was a demon or did she think mind. it was something else? No, it was she climbed up a 20 foot wall, like a squirrel. We knew it was a demon. No, I'm saying, did she know her companion was a demon or did she think it was like a, Benevolent well, spirit. as a child, no, she just said, you know, I'm playing make believe like most kids, you know, imaginary friends, Yeah. which as she got older, realized this is more than imaginary friend, but she didn't know what it was yeah. until it started hurting her. And then she asked for help. But yeah. ironically, she did make it into a religious order, you know, even with all <laughs> the afflictions. So I guess going back to original point is we, we try to understand as best we can what's happening in the diagnosis and there's a very long spiritual questionnaire it's about eight pages you know single spaced you know font 12 type of every aspect of the person's life their mental history physical history sexual history uh spiritual history drug addict all of it and we from that we try to discern what happened here and then when did this event start happening in your life what was happening the week prior to when the first supernatural event occurred? And usually they can pinpoint something, you know, they'll say, well, in, in, in some of the most easy cases, it'll be like, you know, a teenager said, well, we, we played with a Ouija board. We thought it was a game. And then I got home and every night I've had these night terrors and now I feel like killing myself and I'm in despair. Okay. Well, we can tie it back to the Ouija board. Right. So we can get, if they, if they own the Ouija board, we can uh, bless it. And then, uh, burn it and then we do the deliverance over the house and the people there and and hopefully usually nine times out of ten everything's fine but if we don't know what's going on especially if there's a cursed object in the home and we don't know what it is it makes it very difficult that's a case where you really have to dig deep on what's happening here did you pick up any artifacts on any trips you made overseas or to latin america or south america did you bring back lava from uh, hawaii that you weren't supposed to take and then a lot of these questions people go well, what does that matter well because that could be the thing that's cursed it's causing the problems in your home but if you don't know it, it looks random right it's just a random thing we can't figure it out what would you say to say well that's buying into superstition that a piece of lava, you know, that you didn't know anything was bad about it and you bring it into your house. Doesn't God's goodness of his creation supersede any kind of stupid, you know, wicked curse that some person put on it 10,000 years ago before you, you know, innocently grabbed that piece of lava and brought it into your house. You know what I'm saying? I'm just trying to. You, you would hope so. But if, if you're told not to do it. Okay. You're already in this, in disobedience. 
And you're saying local, like if the church says don't do it, or you're saying like well, no, you, I'm saying even the the Hawaiian people say please don't do this because okay. Pele has put a curse on anyone who takes this. Oh, okay. Google, that's just like you said it's hocus pocus. Who cares? Guess what the number one item mailed back to Hawaii from the contiguous states is lava. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> Because they realize their life is falling apart. They want the thing gone. And they 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 research, what do I do? They say, mail it back to Hawaii and, and it will be, wow. everything will be back to normal. So wow. I'm, that's that's substantiated evidence. Yeah. Um, you mentioned like, like another example of something I've heard a little bit contradictory that I wanted you to clarify for me is that I hear a lot of folks say, well, because people say, well, why can't you guys have video evidence of these supernatural things? If you had one, you know, and of course people would always doubt, you know, they'd say it's CGI or tampered with. So that's a fair point to push back on it. But I've heard the priest say, well, it's because that's completely unethical to film, you know, someone in such a horrible state. No one would want to have that taped and put out on there. But then I remember I saw a documentary with Father Amworth, the the the, ex, the chief exorcist at the Vatican, and he, he was on video doing an exorcism of a woman and it and I'm thinking to myself, well, how did that work? You know what I mean? I thought the, I thought the policy was no videotaping the exorcisms, but here's one here. And how's, what's the, I mean, I'm not trying to say he's, I don't, I'm just trying to understand well, that, the policy, is, you know? Yeah. So the policy is discretion for the victim. You know, whenever, in any situation, not just a possessed person, but if there is just like, you think about Princess Diana's car wreck, the, the, the virtuous thing to do is to call for help and try to attend to her while she's dying. But what happened? People ran up and started taking pictures of her in her worst moment so they could make money off it. It's the same with somebody possessed. If it's going to be sensationalized to like bring a weird curiosity uh, to people, that's not healthy, nor is it morally good. So we would never, we might videotape it for the purpose of internal use to go back and look at it to see what was happening, but we would never show that publicly. But do you, are you familiar with what I'm re referencing? There was a document. Yes, I do. Why Father was that allowed? Amen. Yeah. Well, he was kind of um, the Lone Ranger. This is the guy who's like running the show in Rome, and I think he could pretty much do it any way he wanted. Maybe he was using it for the purpose of teaching students. You know, there was also an exorcism school, so maybe I don't know. I don't know. Right. I can't answer the question, but. You also have to understand that every diocese has its own kind of way they, like in America, we have to do a psychological before we can do the right of exorcism. We're the only country that has that rule. Yeah. So different places will have different. And I would imagine if you've done, you know, four or 5,000 exorcisms, you know, your bishop's going to say to you, you know, I think we're just going to let you keep going. Just check in occasionally. Let me know if you need any help, but you know, you're fine. Now, is it one of those cases where it's kind of like the, the WB frog where he doesn't want to sing. If he knows someone's, you know, <laughs> you know, the whole cartoon where he yeah. tries to put them on and he won't do his song and dance right. when no one's, when people are looking, but he only does it when they're not looking. Is that, the, is that what they would, de de demons would do too, you know, to say, well, I'm not gonna, I'm not going to do my parlor tricks that intimidate you if it's going to be taped because it might be used as proof of the supernatural. And, you know, as they say, one of the great tricks of the devil is to, you know, suggest there is no devil or no supernature. Or, that, know, I think that was true for a long time. I think those days are over. Now they're I just think, being open about it. Yeah. I think there's a, an arrogance now in their, uh, and they actually like attention. Yeah. So the minute we see somebody, if we're at a public venue and there's someone manifesting outwardly and you can tell it's a problem, this just happened to me on a pilgrimage I was on. The rule of thumb is to just quietly remove them from the situation, put them in a private room and then pray with them. You, you don't want to do it in public because the, the the general population, even the people who are curious, get freaked out pretty quickly. And it can create a sense of panic and fear. And a panic and fear in a large group is dangerous because then people do things they normally wouldn't do, like stampede and, you know, start doing crazy things. So we try to tend to keep the person isolated when there's a problem happening and to privately address it. I mean, and I understand all those concerns, but at the same time, there's a side of me that thinks, man, you know, if you had skeptical media outlets filming and someone walks 20 feet up a wall, that would be a kind of surprise evidence for the reality of the claims of the church that would probably open up the pathway for millions of people to rethink how serious this 
matter is, you know, because it's like, yeah, of course, there's always the risk of sensationalism. But I think people are so hungry for, you know, materialism has run its course. They're hungry for spiritual reality, but they're still skeptical about organized religion. You know, you know, they want to find spirituality another way. And if if something happens in a way that validates the claims of the organized religion folks in a, in a very extravagant way, it would I, I mean, I don't want to be a mind reader, but to me, I think it would provide a lot of edifying support for people who are on the fence say, you know what, I really need to take organized religion seriously here because this is a skeptical media outlet, NBC, CBS, or whatever, and they literally, their cameras are rolling, and they document someone up in the air, and these people are not biased towards proving this matter, you know, so this is evident, and that would open up millions of people to say, my, we got to take this seriously, let's get our hearts right, you know, I mean, you know, you'd wonder if that would be possible, that could help people. Well, and, and but think about how bad that would be for the woman. Yeah. For the rest of her life, she would be known as Squirrel Lady, and everybody would know who she is, and she probably couldn't get a job anywhere because no one would want somebody like that working. But for if them. she was healed, they'd be like, that's a miracle, right? And she'd be like on TED Talks. This is how I, you know, this is what yes, happened to my exorcism. Except, except yeah. they, they don't want to hear that part. They just want to see the sensational part. Yeah. But I have a feeling because of the way things are going right now that the days are coming when it's going to be visible everywhere because it's going to be so profoundly in our face because too many people are far from God and they don't realize that they're, they're, they're just open game for the devil. And when they start acting out and I'm seeing more and more of it in public where I can right away spot like, Oh, that's not, that's not just a natural problem. That's a demonic problem. And more and more people are coming to me saying, I saw something happen recently at an event and I just knew this was some kind of a demon in this person because of the way they were behaving. And if they had on a cross, they're wearing a cross, how that the person had such an aversion to the cross and uh, literally like sneered at them. So as more and more of these things become prevalent in our society and, pe and people start realizing this is not natural, this is beyond natural, more, I think you will see just the average guy with the phone pick it up and start taping, and then that will make its way into the media. And uh, I, I believe it's the, the teaching is that God permits these supernatural events as a means of witnessing the power of God's power over the spiritual, revealing that the spirit world does exist, and then showing His power over it. Right or no? Is that why He permits yeah, sure. them to do this? You always want to go back to the script. So we yeah. look at Elijah when he goes up against the 450 prophets of Baal. Yeah. Do you remember that story? Yeah. Uh -huh. They're all cutting themselves yeah. and waiting and the, their God doesn't come. And then Elijah calls on God and he comes down. The fire consumes all the sacrifice and the water surrounding the moat. And, and that was it. You know, he, he showed them in a very clear and epic way. I am the one true God. Yeah, and I think he'll be doing that continually as things. The scripture says when great when sin abounds, grace superabounds, and so yeah. we're going to start seeing the superabounding of God's grace in these yeah. days. Now, some people say, just going back to the theological side of this, these can't be uh, fallen angels because those are real, but they were defeated on the cross. You know God, that Jesus took dominion, and that's where Paul talks about the passing of the old order into the new order. And the transition, you know, in which, uh, you know, the principalities and everything are being subdued by Christ exercising dominion as he rules uh, at the right hand of the Father, making all of his enemies a footstool, which is death, devil, and sin. And that would include the demonic uh, entity. So would that mean some people have suggested that, you know, that's as evidence that these are not these entities, but rather, you know, again, going back, it's like real, ent real spiritual entities, but kind of manifestations of humans and their spirits intertwining with one another in a way that creates a diabolical kind of entity on and of itself, but is still a parasitical like extension of human evil, you know, as opposed to the, the fallen angels were crushed and defeated. Right. And until they're going to be loosed at the end for one more temptation. I mean, I know this kind of gets into eschatology and things like that, but. Yeah. Sin and death were defeated on the cross. The demons I don't recall the demons being chained up. <laughs> and I think there's exorcism happening through the acts of the apostles by the apostles. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, certainly St. Benedict, Padre Pio, Curie of Ars, yeah. 
you know, all witnessing of, of demons physically harassing them to the point of beating them up. So uh, you can't make a, a, a self-manifestation of being thrown across the room and, you know, they the other friars come in and see him being physically beaten by what? The wind? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I just think people don't, I don't think people research it enough. I think they come up with a theory and they don't actually apply it and say, well, then why did this, this, and this happen? Yeah. When you um when you look at these uh different stories, are you uh how do you separate or help people separate that which is from the flesh versus that which is a spirit tempting you into a bad thought or bad desire, you know? Because a lot of people will say, Okay, they agree with you that demons do possess, but they think it's extremely rare. It's like the probability of getting bit by a great white. You know, most of the time it's your own flailings in the water or something that's causing your trouble. It's from your own fallen heart that's making you desire mm -hmm. certain things. And you're giving credit where credit shouldn't be given, you know, by saying, well, the devil tempted me. They're saying, why are you always talking about the devil? You know, deal with your own oh, heart. Yeah, you're, okay. So a couple. Yeah. So there's the supernatural element of evil, which is obsession, possession, and oppression and vexation. Right. And all of those maybe take up 5% of what's going on out there. The 95% is the normal or the natural work of the demons, which is to tempt man into sin. Because let's face it, if you're being oppressed by the devil, that doesn't put you in hell. Even if you're, uh, you know, possessed and, and have an obsession in your mind, it's not you that has the thoughts. The devil can put thoughts in your head. You're not going to be responsible for those. But if you sin and you choose to, to, to take the temptation and go with it, now you've just put yourself in jeopardy. Yeah. So they're not, they're not winning, but if everybody were to become possessed, and that means they have operation of your body, physical right. body, right. and they're doing things with your body you don't want to do, yeah. you're not liable for that. Yeah, I'm saying, okay, separate the possession category and oppression and all that. But just the everyday temptation is every is it the idea that every sin that you have is motivated by a temptation from the devil and his in his in his minions, or can some temptations just be totally derived of your own fleshly uh, wickedness? Yeah, or, you know we, what I'm saying. We, yeah, that, the, we this is we attribute sin to the world, the flesh, and the devil. Yeah. Okay. And if you're operating in a very worldly environment, you know if you're uh, living your best life in Vegas and you're plugging into all it offers, the drugs, the money, the booze, the gambling, that's your fault. Yeah. <laughs> you're choosing to do that and, and you can't blame anybody for that. Right. But if you're a contemplative nun who's never seen a male body naked and you're praying in a convent and you're 85 years old and you're having constant thoughts of fornication hitting your brain and it's, it's driving you crazy because you don't want to look at it, I would say that's not that person's sin that's somebody right. attacking your thoughts sure now you said talking about the rise of evil in our time uh what do you think is the source on a on a human level about where this is outpouring is it you know, i think a lot of it is the no fault divorce epidemic and the cheapening of the of the family unit so much of people dabbling with the occult would be driven by some kind of brokenness in their family. And so much of people falling into addictions to mask things that happen to them as children, children are more likely to be uh, molested or assaulted if they're in a broken family, you know, without having an intact, healthy relationship between mother and father. Uh, do you see that divorce as the kind of the, as the re obviously sin, you can always go back to some primal sin before that, but is that really what's driving a lot of this rise in uh, demonic activity in the modern world is the brokenness of families? Well, I would say sin is driving it. What is driving the sin? Um, we know from it's private revelation, but it makes sense because just look at what's going on. If you go back to Humanae Vitae, Paul the sixth, if you read that, he was, he was literally a prophet predicting the future. Um, Sister Lucia said that she was it was real to her by Jesus that the final confrontation against evil would be with the family. It would be an issue of family. This is before the transgender. This is before all the the, the homosexuality issues and all the, all before that. And everybody said, well, how's that going to work? Yeah, and the lack of of true fathers, you know, leading their families to virtue, protecting their place in heaven. That's a big problem. 
when you look at, I think it's 40% plus homes don't have a father that's with them full time. That's enormous, you know, in the formation of those little people. So yeah, it's all a big problem. And then when you factor in, we have the greatest uh, lessening of people going to church. So the mass exodus from churches, not just Catholic, all of them, even the Jews, uh, that the greatest growing majority are the nuns, the N-O-N-E-S, I'm nothing. That's the fastest growing segment of the population. All of that. So if you can divorce yourself from any kind of moral culpability at all, then you can do anything, right? I don't answer to anybody. I can do whatever I want. And there's no penalty unless I get caught. So your religion is to not get caught. But then you can do depraved things and think you're fine. There's a lot That's of people. What we're there's a lot of people, even within so-called conservative denominations in the church and churches that will say, uh, you know, um, God will sanction divorce. You know, there's a lot of times where God will say the Holy Spirit saying that's what you should do is go and divorce because uh, of of Jesus making that reference to the carve out about and Moses about, you know, adult, you know, adultery. Um, is it your opinion as a priest that 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 God and Holy Spirit will give you that desire to divorce? No. I mean, I think he said it. In right. That moment you 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 were referencing he said it was because of your obstinance that moses did that right but if a man divorces his woman without he, he does make a caveat without good reason meaning right. there's some lacking thing that was in the marriage that was not okay but that's a rare thing that's the whole purpose of annulments you know to to identify when a valid marriage did not happen but he says if you do that and and sleep with somebody else you are in adultery right Right. He said it right out of his own mouth. Yeah, it seems like it seems like that really is what's driving so much of what we see in today is the brokenness in families. What is what's creating this chaos where people feel like, well, if my feelings are what trump uh, anything else, it's my feelings, it's my my uh, happiness, my whatever. That seems to be the driving force of of our culture today is whatever your feelings are and however you feel is your truth, as they call it today. Yeah, well, that's unfortunate because it's so myopic and so like, you know, internal to just think that's how the world should be. It's just about your feelings. Yeah. It has no concept, community or growth or integrity of person. Like you should be bigger than your feelings. Yeah. Because feelings come and go and you can't really control your feelings. If I'm angry, I'm angry, but you can control what you do with your feelings. And that's the part nobody's talking about. You may not like something, but that doesn't mean you get to crap all over it just because you don't agree with it. Right. Like, where's the common decency we had 100 years ago? It's just gone. We used to treat people, even if you didn't agree with them, you, they, you'd give them the respect to voice an opinion. And today that's just, you know, they want to cancel you if you don't agree with them. Yeah. It's wrong. It's totally wrong. Um, you know, we, we talk, and Jesus too, you know, his whole thing was about pick up your cross daily and follow me. Self-sacrificial love is what we're called to do, you know, and that means maybe uh, my way isn't going to happen, but that's okay because if, if 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 I have to love God first and my neighbor second and me third, why do you keep why do you keep blasting your feelings all over the place? It's like you you have no concept of how to be a mature adult. And a little bit of restraint and introspection would go a long way, but we don't do that anymore. Yeah. People don't think about anything. People just speak without thinking. And then they look at and they go, oh, that might have been bad because everybody's saying they hate me now. Yeah. When you, you in your biography, you, you worked in Wall Street before you became a priest, right? I did. Did you see a lot of uh, demonic activity within Wall Street and the power establishment, whatever you saw of it? You know, I, I didn't. I didn't see any kind of manifestations like I see in my work now, but you can definitely see the full operation of the seven capital sins for sure, you know, in overdrive, the gluttony, the lust, the envy, all of it. It's all fully present. But I didn't see like, you know, I didn't see people who with like their eyes would go black and they would speak in foreign languages. I didn't see that. Yeah. 
I think bec- I, I have a theory. I think if you're doing a lot of good work for the devil, he kind of leaves you alone. Really? So is he I not? Mean, think, about is he- think about Hollywood. These people, if you're promoting sin and uh, all the seven capital vices, then why would the devil shut you down? Yeah. You're, he's, you're working for him. Yeah. Yeah, it reminds me of what I, I heard. There was an incident where Father... Uh, Malachi Martin was called in by the U S government to Fort Bragg because they were doing psyops mind control. MK ultra was at Fort Bragg at the time and other psychological operation experimentation with like remote viewing and stuff. And, and, and it got out of hand and people were getting possessed in this base where a lot of the CIA and other people were developing these, uh, you know, that whole men stare at goats movie and all that's kind of a reference like with George Clooney where they were doing remote viewing and things like that remote channeling and apparently it got out of hand and the government had to officially call it and they did it quietly it's supposed to be a movie made about i don't know to what extent it will be accurate or whatever but i thought you know how much of there's an article in unheard.com was the sexual revolution a government psyop and it makes you wonder how much of these things that you talk about affecting us are things that were micromanaged at the top level by malevolent forces, you know, who are just hiding behind this is science or this is for the defense of our nation. We need to learn how to get into the minds of people. And it's all rationally, you know, justified, but it's really a demonic plot to unleash a government managed uh, psyop, which is really a spiritual operation to confuse the minds of human beings and children, you know, makes you wonder. Because you look, you look like, for example, like, like the the rise not to. I know that puts you in a bind, maybe be, but uh, you know the rise of psychology to replace the priests. Mm-hmm. You know, like today, it's like oh, you do a priest if you have like that. That's your spiritual life, but then for your mental health and all these things, you got to go to a counselor and a psychologist. This was something that basically around World War II era, the United States government was worried about why are our bombers? You know, they can't finish their missions of of bombing these carpet bombing these uh, cities in, in Europe, we've got to figure out what's going on psychologically. And they said, well, here's this idea. It's repression of their childhood things because of their Christianity. So we need to have psychology come in and become the new place that will therapeutically like rewire human beings to make them more complete without the kind of burdens of, of religion holding them back. And it's like today, that has replaced the priest. A lot of times people go to a counselor and a psychologist says, well, that's the real work. And there's a little extra stuff I'll do on the side for the spiritual matters if things were a little bit nasty, you know, but that's not the way it should be, right? The spiritual place that disciples your family should be first and foremost, your, your, your church. But that was considered to be uh, an enemy with whatever the government's interests were, where they replaced it with therapy and psychology, you know? Yeah, well, what you're saying is they're not killing enough people, so we need to remove their conscience. Yeah. That's, That's what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. okay, that might be a good theory, but you just you just hurt the the future of all these bombers. They're never gonna overcome that. They'll they'll probably wind up killing themselves at some point. And then they killed all these people. So yeah. Why why yeah. does why does Satan waste his time? With, let me let me just push this out. And again, it's crudely said, but why does Satan waste his time throwing a chair and making a nun go up twenty feet when he can start wars all days? I mean, that seems like a much more uh, efficient use of his time. You know what I mean? Like if he's a, if he's super smart, I'm not as smart as that, but I can say to myself, you know. If I've got a war against God, I should be like unleashing nuclear bombs and getting this dictator to go after that dictator and getting this false flag to happen to start this war. That's where all the fun is doing, you know, a parlor trick is like a waste of my time, especially, you know, and I don't understand why in that calculus, if he's so smart, why he would do it unless God's making him do it to make him look foolish, you know, you know, in in some way, you know, it's like, what, why waste your time? You know, oh, you know, I'm making you levitate. You could be starting a war right now, killing 20 million people. Why are you doing the levitation right now? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, I think we're, there's a war going on right now. Right? Yeah. And it's between a power that has nuclear weapons. Right. And the other power that we're supporting. <laughs> so I think he's using every avenue. Yeah. Yeah. But why do, why do, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is why use a, a parlor trick when you've got more grand designs that you don't even have to worry about people 
becoming aware of the spirit world. You know what I mean? You can just keep it everything on the down low. No, no chairs floating. Cause when a chair floats, that makes people want to pray. You know what I'm saying? Typically that's going to make someone want to pray. If there's war and there's no chairs floating, you typically think, well, maybe there's just no God, you know, there's nothing real. There's nothing beyond matter. It's just human flesh killing each other. My goodness. I have no hope. But if there's a chair floating and there's a war, you think, huh, maybe there's something behind that war. You know what I mean? It opens the veil of the spirit world. And I don't know, I guess they just say he's so smart. I'm like, well, I think that way. Why? I mean, he's way smarter than me. So I don't know. I don't, I don't want to, I just think about these things, <laughs> you know, I think, all the major wars we've had have been in, had had a demonic influence for sure. Yeah. You know, certainly world wars. I mean, and I think there's another one coming. There's another yeah. big war coming, and it. I think it takes time for him to manipulate enough to get it set up. And you have to realize the angels are working against them, and and so is God. God will only permit what He wants to permit. You know, and He. He on occasion he does step in and say this isn't going to happen. Yeah, and there's an, and there are people praying against things. You know, Our Lady has said that uh, the Rosary can stop wars if enough people are praying it. Yeah. So there's all these factors that go into something that we don't see. We only see this side of the veil, but when you go on the other side of the veil, there's a whole bunch of things happening that we don't know about, and so we don't know. Yeah, uh, maybe that nun was destined for something uh, incredibly uh, fulfilling for the world. Who knows? And maybe that's why he chose to block her. I don't know. Yeah. Why do you, um, what is a story or something you could share with folks along that line that helps people believe in the reality of this and get their hearts right with God, you know, because there's something, because we've been so programmed, we, we're dealing with psychological programming. We have been programmed from the day we're born Darwinism. You know, there is nothing. It's, you know, this, this stuff was just wish fulfillment, spiritual, Freudian, whatever, daddy in the sky stuff. It's all this repression stuff. And then, you know, and then the, and then priests like such as yourself are coming out and saying, okay, these things I'm seeing are real. And of course, obviously evidence doesn't fully win you over because if you have a heart and heart, you'll believe whatever. But what can you say to folks who are listening right now who are just, they, they're even Christian. But they're so conditioned by materialism and secularism that they just say, well, yeah, maybe he heard that story. Maybe he was staying up too late and he saw, and he thought he saw the nun go up 20 feet. And he was just caught up in the moment of a hysterical night of no sleep deprivation or something. You know, how can you help that doubting, doubting Thomas, who's even Christian, to say, no, this is real from the bottom of my heart. You need to get right with God because this is a war that you can't lose. Well, my own personal theory about people believing is that a third of the people believe whatever you tell them. A third of the people believe nothing you tell them. And a third of the people are open to listen and weigh the pros and cons and think about it. So I'm not here to convince you. You get to choose. You get one life to live. And if you want to go against God your whole life, you can do that. He'll let you. But what makes you think ignoring or alienating or directly confronting God your whole life, what makes you think at the end of life, suddenly he's you're going to want to be with him and he's going to want you to be with him. You know, what, if you don't want him in this life, you don't get him in the next. It's that clear. So you get to choose. And if you're a guy that likes to be on the side of, um, you know, a good bet, live your whole life without God and you find out at the end there is a God, but you blew it. You're now eternally gone. That's a bad bet. Yeah. Let's go the other way. Let's pretend there could be a God and you live your life pursuing the, the knowledge of that God. And at the end of life, you find out he's real. And he says, no, I saw you trying to find me and I saw you searching for me and I saw you doing your best to live a good life. And now you will you will have this reward and it will be forever <laughs> that's a good bet you know why would you bet against eternity that's crazy but for those people who want to see it, i think one of the most um influential videos i've ever watched is a man named howard storm s-t-o-r-m he was an art professor i think in ohio he was an atheist self-professed atheist and he also said he never did anything bad he never cheated on his taxes. He didn't 
cheat on his wife. He didn't kick the dog. Just didn't believe in God. He went on a, uh, he took a group of students to Paris for an art exhibit and he died while he was in Paris. And he remembers exactly what happened. The whole thing is 100% clear. He suddenly came out of his body. He went up to this place. He saw light this way, but there was a darkness this way. And these people came, he called them people. And they kind of took him and started leading him towards this way away from the light. And at first they were fairly polite, or at least they weren't rude. And the further they got into the darkness, the more they started abusing him until they were ripping his flesh off his body and doing horrible things to him that when he tells that when he recounts the story, he's physically very emotional because he he's almost reliving it. And he says he got stuck. He finally got placed in this pit in the bottom of this abyss. And then they left him alone. And he says the desolation is so overwhelming of being alone and not having the presence of God where you feel nothing but desolation that he wanted the demons to come back and continue to abuse him because it was better than the desolation he felt. Wow. And he tried to think of a prayer. He knew no prayers because he didn't know. He was like the Pledge of Allegiance is coming to his mind. He knew nothing. And then he finally just said, Jesus, help me. And this light comes down into the pit and pulls him out and takes him to a place. He says it wasn't heaven, but it wasn't hell. And Jesus said, you know, he had a, a nun take one of his art classes. And when she came in that day in her habit, he said, you can take the class. But if you mention his name, you're out. And the nun knew immediately, oh, I'm really here to pray for him. And Jesus said, because of her prayers, I'm going to send you back. This is your final chance. If you want to be with me, you have to change your life. So he did come back in his body. And it was a very long, it was like 20 minutes with a toe tag. And then he got up and told his wife everything that happened. And he quit his job and he became a pastor. And all he does is preach the truth of Jesus and his great mercy, but also the devil is real. And I think if you don't believe, at least watch that and ask the Holy Spirit to enlighten your heart. I think people will come around to it. And do you think another, you, you mentioned people taking people away. It reminds me that this new thing they're pushing from the government and media is extraterrestrials. Some people have said, oh my goodness, you know, Jimmy Carter, he asked, this is something going around the internet. Jimmy Carter, when he was president, he asked over and over again to see the evidence of do the UFOs exist? And then they said he was weeping and weeping because they finally showed him that, that they had seeded the, you know, Christian religion and everything as like some kind of, you know, fairy tale to keep their engineered life forms, human beings behaving themselves on earth. And they're the real gods. I I'm worried that that's going to be a new great deception that will oh, really yes. leave. What would you say to that? How can people? hundred percent. We have been setting this up for 50 years with all the Star Wars and Star Trek and all these extraterrestrial films, right? And yeah. programs and TV series. So basically Americans at this point think, well, yeah, we've already been watching this for 50 years. Of course it's real. When and if these things come, here's what I predict. They're going to be far beyond us in intelligence. And they're going to say, we have been where you are. We understand what you're going through. You have all these trials in life. We have reached perfection. And we're here to tell you that they're really, Jesus was not God. The universe is God. And you have to come with us to worship in order to unlock the secrets of the universe. It's going to be along these lines. It's going to try to get people away from formal religion and into the universe religion. And people will do it. Because they'll say, look, this clearly that they, they're flying these machines that are so advanced, they have to be telling the truth. Yeah. But I think they're demons. They're impersonating yeah. aliens, but it's a demon. And the Vatican says that they don't they don't necessarily exclude that all aliens are evil, but that, that if that scenario presents itself, that would be an evil scenario, right? You know what I'm saying? Like the the possibility of extraterrestrials, I think. From what I understand, it they've made some statements on it that 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 there would be possibilities that God has other created beings, but I guess the checkpoint about whether you accept what they're saying or not would be whether it contradicts your uh, faith, right, in God, right? I mean, that's the that's the that's kind of the litmus test whether you trust them or they're devils or whatever. Right? Well, you know, you would think in the creation account there would be some note if there was a significant intelligent life that we don't know about in the story, yeah. and there isn't. 
But the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 356, says this, of all visible creatures, only man is able to know and love his creator. He's the only creature on earth that God has willed for its own sake. But all visible creatures, only man is able to know and love his creator, which means rational, able to have a will and an intellect. Clearly, a uh, an alien that builds a spaceship would have to have an intellect and a will, so that would kind of rule that out. Right. right. But it would still be open for it to be a demon because yeah. they don't have corporal bodies, but they can inhabit and look like they do. Right. Well, very, very good. I really appreciate the the different topics that you've been able to explore with us today. And I think it's edifying. I hope it is for folks who are, um, you know, going through a rough time because it is a rough time. I think people have a lot of despair, uh, a lot of uh, confusion and uh, alienation, and they don't know. Um, I mean, we're watching at the very least the end of the American empire as a, you know, supremacy around the world. And so that's a kind of apocalyptic moment for people living through that in Europe as well. I mean, they're rapidly declining the Nord Stream pipelines, accelerating their economic decline since it got blown up. People are in a lot of tailspin and they feel like, well, where's, where's God in all of this, you know? So that's where I wanted to bring you on to kind of help edify people who are struggling with the reality of God's yeah. presence in our time. But just a final thought, you know, when, when things go really well and, and when people are winning, they always take the credit. Yeah. Always. A hundred percent of the time is yeah. never, I've never seen one per, occasionally at an awards thing. Somebody go, Oh, I thank God too, but look what I did. And when things go bad and things aren't working, they blame God. Yeah. It should be the reverse. Yeah. When things are going really well, give him the credit. And when things are falling apart, it's saying we've sinned, Lord have mercy on us. Yeah. That should be the response. So if you're having a tough time, you know, turn to Jesus and just say, I think I've made a mess of this. Please help me out of it. I want you to be in my life. He will come in 100%. Never, there's never been a single person that went to him for help that he said no, yeah. if they were authentically looking for his help. With that, I'm going to give you my blessing. The Lord be with you. May awesome. Almighty bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a wonderful day. God bless you. Good to be with you, David. Thank you. God bless Thank you too. You.